grateful for all the work Mercer's done um, in the past with uh, producing mounds of data for reporters like me to look through. Um, but in your surveys of employers, big and small, what are some of the recent trends that you're seeing and how they're changing their benefit design, um, both because of the ACA and separate from it? Yeah, I would start off with the first um, kind of foundational driver of change most recently that will surprise you. Uh, we did a survey this summer, about 900 employers participated in it, and almost 40% of them told us that they were already making changes in 2014 in anticipation of the excise tax in 2018. And that may surprise you, but the fact of the matter is that the excise tax since the law was passed has been the number one concern of employers. And so tell us about the excise tax, just to back up for a second. Sure. This is the Cadillac tax. The excise tax does not go into effect until 2018, which you know is the last thing on the list of all of the things that employers have to do. And it is a 40% tax on the cost of benefits above a threshold. So if you have a high cost plan that exceeds the threshold, you as the employer are taxed 40% on the amount above that threshold. And so you see employers already responding to that even though the rule doesn't take effect for four more years. They're already responding. They are moving people into consumer directed plans, which um, for those of you that aren't familiar with that term, it's basically a high deductible PPO that has an account alongside it, whether it's a health reimbursement account or a health savings account. And the interesting thing is that from our survey, we know that those plans, the consumer directed plans, cost about 20% less than a PPO plan. So it enables the employer to basically reset the benefit value as the basis, as a core plan offering for providing benefits. And um, you know, it more than meets that 60% plan criteria under the Affordable Care Act. So you see employers moving more, pay, more workers into these high deductible plans. What about, um, there's been a lot of concern that employers will stop offering insurance altogether, um, perhaps the most extreme end, and then you see employers such as Walgreens, we heard from earlier today, moving uh, their workers into private exchanges. How do you see both uh, the movement to private exchanges and public exchanges playing out? So um, we've been asking employers every six months since the law was passed what their plans were, whether or not they would consider exiting um, providing health insurance once the public exchanges go live. And the, probably the highest percentage that we saw was around 8% across all size employers. Um, it's, it's right around 6% right now with our most recent survey. Now I will tell you, when you look at small employers versus you know, anybody that has more than 500 employees, those on the smaller end of the range, you know, it's about a quarter of them that would consider um, exiting and sending their employees to the to the public exchange, whereas on the larger end of the scale, you know, it's five percent or less of employers that are saying that they would do that. So that's the public exchange. And is that really because the penalty for not offering your employees insurance is just so much smaller than the cost of providing that insurance? Why do you see it concentrated among small employers? I think, you know, for small employers, they are the buyers in the insured marketplace. And with all of the changes under the ACA, you know, all of those patient protections have a cost associated with it. And so um, that combined with the underwriting guidelines and the taxes and the fees, and, you know, when you add it all together, it just becomes a really large financial burden that, you know, many of them would you know, appreciate having another place to send their employees. But what I will say, when we segue into private exchanges, um, you know, using our own experience as a case study, we've signed up um, 33 employers for our private exchange starting in 2014. And the interesting thing is that the groups in there range in size from 100 employees to 30,000 employees. And so it's a huge mix. About three quarters of them are actually 2,000 employees or less. And what that suggests is that that um, approach is a pretty good vehicle for a middle market size employer that's looking to save money, provide choice, get some support for compliance, and make their employees happy. Just to be clear to define for the audience what a private exchange 
is. It's mm -hmm. more like a, d a change from a defined benefit contribution that we used to see in pensions to defined contribution that you see now. Is that a? Not necessarily. I would describe it as, you know, think about Amazon.com for benefits. You know, it is a benefits marketplace where an employer provides funding and the employee goes shopping for their benefits and they pick exactly you know, what they want to meet their needs. In ours, it's not just medical, but it's medical, dental, vision, life, disability, voluntary, everything. Um, the other thing is that of our 33, only half are going to find contribution. So the other half are sticking with price tags on their benefits. Those who were self-insured before are staying self-insured. Those who were insured before are staying insured. Why do you think that is? Why the reluctance to move to defined contribution? You'd think that clearly it would offer a lower price for employers. Um, you know, I don't know about the audience, but our experience is that employers like to make gradual changes. They like to ease their employees into something that's brand new. And so, you know, depending on how big of a hurdle it would be for them to get all the way to define contribution, they may have just decided, let's get on the platform, let's you know, go with the administration, the choice, you know, all of the other aspects, and we'll get there you know, over a couple of years with the defined contribution. Thank you. So, so John, at yes. ADP, you have a huge amount of real data uh, that you can mine for, for information uh, about how employers and employees are adapting. What are you... What are you finding in your amount well, of data? Well, a couple of things we're finding in a recent uh, study we did, uh, there's a lot of confusion around health care reform. Uh, and the two key areas are really on the excise tax uh, as well as the uh, shared responsibility, the employer mandate. Uh, the excise tax is a big one um, in particular. And, and it, I, I think employers were going to have to do something about health care costs anyway, so the excise tax is not necessarily the, the key thing driving it, but it's probably become the, the trigger to make them take action. Because if you go back and you look at, for 48 consecutive years, we have not had a single year where per capita health care spending has not increased faster than the rate of inflation. So that's a huge driver. Uh, employers are beginning to make cutbacks in their plans. Um, but getting back to the confusion issue, we have the survey findings found that 70, I think it was 70 or 71 percent of our, our of the, uh, not survey, the data we pulled, clients told us that they were comfortable that they could comply with health care reform. But then less than half of them told us they understood the rules. <laughs> it's, you know, and that's just, you read these results and you start saying, well, if you think you can comply and you don't understand the rules, how do you get from point A to point B? Uh, but we are seeing another big issue on the shared responsibility. In particular, uh, employers are beginning to realize that they've got to begin to integrate the uh, data from their payroll, their benefits, and their time and attendance systems. And just to stop for one moment, by shared responsibility, you mean the penalty that employers will have to pay? The employer, yeah, the employer mandate. There's a rule out there that basically says if the employer doesn't provide adequate benefit levels of coverage uh, to the appropriate populations, and I won't get into all the definitions, but if they don't meet those these very, very clearly defined requirements, uh, that they pay penalties, and they could be as high as $2,000 per uh, full-time employee minus the first 30. It could be an individual penalty of $3,000, and in both cases, the penalties are non-deductible. So employers are going to have to really begin to do data dives. Uh, it's no longer a question of, I, it's not going to work well when they have a payroll system, a benefit system, and a time system that don't talk to one another. Uh, by law, they really are going to have to pull data from all of those systems. They're going to have to report that to the federal government on an annual basis. They're going to have to report it to the employees on an annual basis. Uh, and that data becomes part of the employee's permanent tax file, so it's got to be maintained for at least seven years. And it's going to be critical when penalties are assessed on, from the federal government back to employers that they're going to be able to do reconciliations to dispute inappropriate penalty assessments. And, and there will be some inappropriate penalty assessments. I mean, there's errors built into the law. I mean, one exa well, one example, it's not a bad, you know, it's just a question of how they try to accommodate employers. The employer is going to determine affordability on the basis of W-2 earnings. Uh, the exchange and the federal government are going to look at uh, adjusted gross family income. So right there, that definitional difference will probably trigger penalty assessments on, the, on employers who, if they have the appropriate data and can reconcile back, are going to be able to demonstrate they don't owe the penalty. And so was the delay, when the Obama administration announced that it would delay the employer mandate by one year, you know, everything else supposedly is beginning January 1, 2014, the employer mandate is supposedly now going to begin January 1, 2015, with, your, with the companies that you work with, did that come as a relief? Did that change? Uh, 
did, did that change their policies, their forward thinking plans in any material way, or was it just kind of buying a bit more time um, to logistically address some of the issues that, well, John, you raised? it's somewhat of a misnomer. Uh, the, the employer mandate really hasn't been delayed. The reporting and the penalty requirements around it have been delayed. But technically, employers are supposed to voluntarily comply beginning January 1, 14. Uh, and the advice that ADP has been giving our clients is that you ought to make every effort to completely voluntarily comply. And I think most of our clients are doing so. Now, what it has done is it's, take the, it's taken the pressure off that if, they, if their data is not perfect, they're not at risk for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, of dollars in penalties this year. Uh, and they certainly have the time now to make sure that data is clean and they're comfortable with it as they go into 15. But, you know, our clients, I, I can't swear that every single one of them is doing it, but I know the vast majority are attempting to voluntarily comply. Tracy, what did you see among <coughs> your uh, employers as they responded to the delay? So we'll know more um, as we get to the end of this year, but um, I would say that there were, that there are certain industries, mainly retail and hospitality, that were relieved by the delay. Um, and for all of the reasons that, that um, John stated, but you know, also just because of the enormity of the population that will now be eligible for benefits. You know, the change to the 30-hour work week as the metric ha has a very significant cost impact on that segment of industry. And, and just so, to, uh, and again, we're just going to yeah. kind of define it a little bit because employers are only required to offer insurance for full-time employees, 50 or more, and if you're part-time, 30 or less, you don't, that doesn't count towards your uh, employer base that would require you to offer insurance, is that? Right, employers are, will, are required under the law mm -hmm. to make the offer of coverage to anybody that works 30 or more hours a week. And in most um, um, pop, you know, industries that have a huge variable our workforce, they probably did not define eligibility as 30 hours prior to the passing of the law. And so, you know, it might have been 40 hours, or they may have just been in a category of hourly employees that were not eligible for benefits. And that all changes with this new requirement. I would say that that's the most significant um, impact of the delay. Probably three quarters of the employers in the U.S provide benefits to you know, all of their full-time employees and they more than meet the 60% minimum plan value requirement. The affordability could be a little questionable for some, but you know, not a huge um, hurdle for many employers. But those that have the large hourly workforce are really impacted significantly by the law. Have you seen um, among the companies that you work with uh, evidence of some of the alarmist stories that have played out in the press. So there's been a lot of attention among Republican lawmakers that uh, Obamacare is a job-killing law because for this very reason that you just described, employers are incented not to hire uh, more workers. They're incented to have more part-time labor. Um, I know in the, in the Fed, various uh, publications from the Federal Reserve, I think in the Beige Book earlier this year, there was uh, talk of employers saying that they were limiting hiring is this something that you see, is this real, or is it just kind of anecdote? Um, what are you, what's the real data here? I'll share some, and you probably have I some have too. Some too. Yeah. Um, our, the surveys that we've done um, last year and even this summer suggest that about 10% of employers are making changes to their workforce management strategies in light of the law. And so you could interpret that a couple of different ways. Um, it might mean that for future hires that are part-time, that you do limit the number of hours that they work. It could be that you restructure your workforce for part-time versus full-time. You know, it could be a number of things. But our data suggests about 10% of employers are considering that. It doesn't mean that they have taken that action, but it is definitely of consideration for business reasons. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're seeing basically uh, three trends in the marketplace. Uh, one is <clears throat> to manage the workforce more actively. So we are seeing some of our clients, and I don't, I don't have specific data yet because you know the year hasn't quite begun, but um, we are seeing clients move more people to part-time status and or, and or decide to actively manage people who are part-time actively below 30 hours. Uh, so frequently they're setting a 27 or a 25 hour threshold and that they're using that as kind of their bar to make sure people don't exceed the 30. Uh, we are also surprisingly, though, seeing a trend, uh, and it's very unique to certain types of organizations, to move more people to full-time status. 
Uh, in particular, I've seen this in professional services firms where they have very few part-timers to begin with. And what they've done is an assessment that says, I can make these people full-time and actually save money in my administrative costs in terms of not having to track hours of service. Because uh, hours of service is not just, you know, we've been talking about hours worked, but it also includes unpaid leaves for things like uh, military leave, family medical leave, and jury duty. And a lot of employers don't have really good data around that. Right. So what they found, if they have very few part-timers, it may make sense to move them into a full-time status. And then I think the overwhelming majority, probably 75 to 85 percent, and we'll have better data as January <laughs> kicks in, uh, are not doing much of anything. They're going to comply with the law, but they're kind of going to ride it out for a year and get a better handle on what it really means in terms of the impact. What about the shop exchange? So um, maybe if one of you could provide an overview of what it is and some of the challenges that we've seen in having it come to come into existence. You want to take a crack? Well, I will help define it. So the Shop Exchange is an opportunity for small employers to purchase health insurance for their employees through the um, public exchange, through the public marketplace. Um, it got off to a fairly rough start, mm -hmm. I think that's fair to say, and I'm not sure that it is fully operational. I don't know that any groups yeah. have enrolled in it. I think that that think enrollment may be, be delayed. End of November, mid to end of November is what they've said now. Yeah. And the concept originally was going to look a lot like the public exchanges are supposed to look like. So conceptually, small employers were going to be allowed to offer their employees virtually all the plans that are offered in their state exchange. Uh, now what happened is the administration, one, has been delayed, and two, at least for 14, the employer is going to be limited to a single plan that he, can, he or she can offer their employees. So what they'll do is they'll, they'll go into the exchange and they'll pick this plan and they'll make that available to their employees. Uh, some employers may be eligible for a uh, tax credit subsidy to help offset the cost if they make certain contributions and their, their employees have certain demographic characteristics. Uh, but uh, it has certainly has not had a big splash at the moment. So I'll ask one more question before opening it up to the audience. But one of the things about uh, the employer-sponsored market in America and about coverage around the employer-sponsored market in America is that it's just so, it's such a weird system. You know, why should it be that my employer is deciding for me what type of health plan, why should that employer be in the business of sponsoring health insurance? Why can't I sort of have portable insurance and that is part of what the Affordable Care Act tries to achieve but while maintaining this big employer-sponsored employer system. And so I guess my question to you is, um, are these initial changes that we're seeing in the employer-sponsored market moving to more consumer-directed plans, moving to the private exchanges, um, the very bumpy start of the public exchange? In 10 years, do you think we're even going to have employer-sponsored insurance? I don't think employers are going to be allowed to bail out. Uh, they may not sponsor it in the way we see plans today, but the funding of this is not something the federal government wants to assume. So the affordability requirements, which could morph into a funding requirement over time, I mean, that's not out of the question, but the affordability requirements keep employers in the game and the penalties associated with that. Uh, so I don't see any way that the federal government is going to allow employers just to kind of say, wash their hands of it and walk away. I think what they will do is potentially, I, my guess is that we're going to see more and more exchange alternatives, what public exchanges, private exchanges, uh, I see some employers, once they're eligible to participate in the public exchange, and I'm assuming here that the public exchanges eventually get up and running, you know, that they, we don't have the website problems and all the other issues we're faced with as they roll out. But beginning in 2017, large employers are going to potentially be allowed to participate as employers in the public exchange. And then it becomes a question of what's more attractive, a private exchange, a public exchange, and I don't see the traditional employer-based model surviving that. But it'll be interesting. What, what are your thoughts, Tracy? So today, employers cover, I think it's around 55 million people in their plans. So a formidable expense that's being borne by the employers. And I think that that would be difficult for us to absorb in our economy through any type of subsidies. Um, as employers have thought about exiting, the cost associated with that when you factor in what employees might expect in their compensation is way greater than what they're currently because spending Because of the preferential on. tax treatment for employer-sponsored insurance? It's a number of things. I mean, you pay the penalty. That's not tax mm -hmm. deductible. Um, currently, probably about 20% of the workforce opts out of benefits. So if you're going to give everybody a sweetener because you're taking away their health insurance, there's not enough money to make everybody happy. The people that, that are only going to buy individual coverage mm -hmm. will be fine. 
those who need family coverage, are probably going to be about $10,000 short even with the sweetener of what they're going to need to buy insurance. And by and sweetener, you mean raising the salary because right, right. now additional compensation, additional compensation. Right. Yeah. So I think that that, you know, from an economic perspective, is really the issue. Beyond that, I think you know, healthcare benefits are a, an attraction and retention tool. I think it's a differentiator for employers. Um, I do think that we'll see changes to how benefits are offered. You know, we're already seeing that in the movement to consumer directed plans and the private exchanges, but I think that, that they'll still be around. Okay, so any questions from the audience on employer sponsored insurance or some of the changes we see among companies? Yes, um, a microphone will come to you. How do you see the move by large employers to contract with health systems fitting into this? Will that go away as well, do you think, or will that be a feature of the uh, health care um, environment going forward? I'm sorry, we missed the first part uh, of Yeah, I missed question. the first couple of oh, I'm words. sorry. With, with large employers contracting with health systems for care, do you see that as a feature that will continue, or will that go away as, as uh, the health care environment uh, transforms. So you mean large employers contracting directly with health systems rather than using their their insurance companies' networks? Yeah, I think that that it will be a very interesting dynamic. And I know earlier in the day that you've had some sessions around healthcare delivery. Um, but if you think about what's going on with the development of the accountable care organizations and medical homes and the like. You know, we could end up in a situation where employers are contracting directly with each of those delivery systems and, you know, looking very much like the environment almost 15 years ago when an employer might offer 20 different HMOs, um, albeit very different from a delivery system perspective. Hopefully, we're going to do a better job on it this time um, with, you know, with all the lessons that we've learned along the way. But yes, I think that that's entirely possible. Yeah, I think we're in the next decade is probably going to be one of a lot of experimentation. <clears throat> I think you're going to see people looking at defined contribution strategies. Uh, you're going to see some employers keeping with their traditional plans, you know, model. Uh, some employers going to the exchanges. Some employers deciding they're going to contract directly with providers. Um, so I think over the next eight to ten years, we're going to see a lot of employer experimentation as they kind of figure out what works best in this new world. Yeah, even retail. Yeah, well, we had a session in Real Talk Clinics. Um, those will certainly continue to grow. Any other questions? Uh, yes, in the back. Can you comment on the, on the recent trend? And if you could say who you are, please. Oh, yeah, Cliff Kalb, uh, formerly with Merck. Uh, can you comment on the recent trend for large employers to eliminate health insurance for early retirees? in the window between age 55 and 65 so that they're not eligible for Medicare and they are too well compensated in their afterlife to be eligible for Medicaid? Good question. Yeah, so we've seen a decline in employers um, subsidizing retiree medical coverage fairly steadily over the past 10 years. Um, we tend to see um, the coverage still provided for pre-65 retirees because once you turn 65, the marketplace is fairly well regulated as it relates to the um, Medicare and Medicare supplement type plans. Um, with the um, public exchanges, that now becomes an opportunity for an early retiree to get coverage. We actually did some modeling just using you know, data available in the market on um, average incomes for workers once they've retired pre-65. If you have a um, defined benefit and a defined contribution plan for retirement, or if you only have a DC you know, 401k type program. And what we found through that modeling is that a good number of early retirees that only have a DC plan would, would likely be eligible for subsidized coverage in the, in the public exchange. And I think, you know, as we get through the next year with the public exchange and employers get a feel for what does the coverage look like, how much does it cost, how does it work for people, that that could very well be the impetus for them deciding, you know, those that are, that are still offering a pre-65 retiree medical plan to go ahead and, and send um, the early retirees to the public exchange. So it is a trend. 
and I think it's important to keep in mind, the Congressional Budget Office has estimated that 69% of all taxpayers, if they're not covered through an employer plan, will be eligible for a subsidy in the uh, public exchanges. And those subsidy levels go up pretty substantially. It's up to 400% of the federal poverty level. So using 2013 numbers, a family of four earning over $94,000 a year would be eligible for a subsidy. And a single individual over, I think it's just under $46,000 a year, would be eligible for a subsidy. So under, uh, under, under 46,000 <laughs> will be eligible for a subsidy. Uh, so you know, there's, there's going to be some, I think, impetus for employers to kind of evaluate how well it's working uh, and potentially give a, an additional subsidy to their employees. It could be an adjustment in some kind of a pension payment uh, to help offset some of the costs. But I, I think that's likely to be a continued trend. Any other questions? Yes, in the corner. Hi, Ben Wanamaker, Clayton Christensen Institute. The conversation so far has been mostly about the employer's financial arrangement as it uh, relates to provision of health care. I'm curious to your views as to whether large self-insured players will get more or less involved in the actual provision and delivery of care, um, both at the primary and tertiary levels of care, and, and why you think it will, that will become more or less prominent in the future. So um, <clears throat> let me be sure I understand your question. So, you, so you're asking how you think people will access care under the large self-insured programs? I'm not sure I understood the question. Sorry, let me clarify. What I'm saying is that large self-insured employers, um, there are a very small number of them that actually go into owning the delivery of care. Employer uh, owned. Providing care on Correct. site, meaning Correct. on site health care facilities? Correct. On site health care facilities, direct contracting with their own networks, et cetera. Can you comment on whether you think large self insured employers will become more involved in okay. the delivery of care in the future or less involved and why? You know, I think it's a really good question because as we have these 30 million Americans that haven't had health insurance that could potentially go on the exchange and now have access to care. We're certainly anticipating that that will put some pretty big demands on the healthcare delivery system. And so we have seen a greater interest in on site healthcare clinics and on site healthcare providers. We are also seeing big interest in alternative types of delivery, um, such as telemedicine, has become very big with self insured employers over the past couple of years. So I think that employers will get sort of creative in how they look at where are the opportunities for for them to provide access um, for their employees. I think, you know, as we think more about the high deductible health plan and the movement in that direction, employers are very sensitive to what that means to their employees in terms of out of pocket when they actually need care. And so part of their efforts to provide a softer landing for employees is helping them figure out other places or the best place to get care, you know, at the right time at, at the most appropriate cost. So I think we'll see a combination of strategies. I'm going to, um, we have to wrap up, but I, because I'm the moderator, I get to ask the last question. Um, I'm really interested to learn, um, employers have at some periods, and it varies very much from one employer to the next, but been in some ways passive in the broader transformation of the healthcare system. Um, and I'm wondering whether, you, and you may take issue with that, but I'm wondering whether you see employers increasingly um, driving some of the changes that we've talked about today, whether it's really pushing um, consumers to, uh, to value-based products, which they are already starting to do, or really trying to incent, um, incent employees to take care of themselves through wellness programs. I'm just wondering if employers, um, if they're evolving or if some are evolving into sort of more active agents of change in trying to drive greater value throughout the healthcare system? I think the answer is yes. Yeah. And I would put out as evidence for that. Um, last year, our survey documented the lowest increase in the cost of employer-sponsored health plans in 15 years. And that is, in light of healthcare reform, driving up costs, you know, one to 5% on top of trend, depending on your situation. So lowest cost increase in 15 years, right around 4%. Now for, for a couple of years in a row, we're seeing very, very low trends. 
And some of that is cost shifting, I will, I will grant that. But I think a good bit of it too is a commitment to better delivery, to increased awareness around what we all need to do to take better care of ourselves. Half of employers offer incentives for people to be more engaged in their own health care. And so I think we're seeing those efforts pay off and I think that that will fuel the employer's interest in being more and more active in that area of managing the plans. Yeah, and I, I would echo that. I, I think the critical thing here is that costs, even at low trends, are going up at more than two times the rate of inflation. The official inflation rate right now is about 1.7%. And when you see companies getting great trends of 4 and 5 and 6%, which is dramatically down from what they had been 10 and 15 years ago, those are still 2 and 3 and 4 times the rate of inflation. So companies are, are struggling with how do we get these costs under control. I think healthcare reform has put a real spotlight on it and it has given them some ideas of things they might want to do, and, and it's even given them some incentives in the case of wellness. Uh, but I don't think it's something that you, that's brand new. I think it is important to note that healthcare spending nationally has been growing at the exact same rate as GDP for the past three years as well, 3.9%. Right. So Such a big part of it. It is, that's for sure. <laughs> um, though that it has been remaining steady, if you're gonna really <laughs> search for some kind of icing on a bungled cake or I'm not sure what the metaphor is, but um, I think that uh, on that note, we're going to end the panel. There's clearly a lot to come as employers try to navigate this changing environment of the ACA. Um, big changes coming for employer-sponsored insurance. So we're very grateful to you for both of your insights, and please thank our panelists. Thank you.